So there was a man who once claimed to a psychiatrist that he had swallowed a horse. And despite the psychiatrist trying his best to convince him that it's not possible, he refused and insisted that he wanted surgery so the horse can be removed surgically. So the psychiatrist collaborated with the surgeon and they decided to take this guy in and uh, do a procedure where they can make him sleep and then wake up. And in the time in between, they wanted to bring a real horse into the operating room so that when the man woke up, they assumed he would uh, think that the operation was a success. So they did indeed bring the horse in and you know, put this guy to sleep for a while and then he woke up and he opened his eyes and exclaimed, that's not the horse I swallowed, it's white. The one I swallowed was black. <laughs> Supposed to be a joke, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you think of anxiety, you know, we, we all have different things that makes us anxious in life. And what makes you anxious may sound absurd to me. It would not make me anxious and vice versa. But anxiety is something that we all deal with. When I was a kid, um, I was very anxious every time I was about to take an examination or I was competing in stuff, and whenever I would go for them, I'll be super tense and, excited and anxious. But there were only two times when I was really, really anxious significantly in life. And the first time was when I met my wife, Jemima. She's not here today, so I can speak more comfortably. You know, I'd just seen her picture, and um, we had an arranged date, you know, it's called P Harmony, those days, where your parents help you you know, it's free, and you don't have to pay any subscription for that. I already liked her, and uh, I just had a couple of things I wanted to find out from her. But I was very anxious before that date, because I was thinking, what if she sees me and, and, and you know, doesn't like me and doesn't say yes? I mean, that's always the case. You know, when you have this DTR talks, I mean, that's... That's really difficult. It can create a lot of anxiety. Because I thought if she says no to me, that would just crush my sense of self-worth and existence. But thankfully, she said yes, and you know things turned out differently. The other time I was very anxious was when I lived in Germany, and when we were about to move here to the US, and uh, it was about uh, getting a visa to come into this country. My research contract had ended there, and we were excited to leave and come here to the Bay Area, only to find out that I had to clear several levels of security and background check. So we did not know whether it's going to come or not come, and I had already you know, uh, finished my contract. So I had monthly contracts that had to be created, and I had a wonderful boss who was willing to do it, and we ended up changing five houses in six months. So it was also getting a house. We wouldn't know at the end of each month if we'll get another house, if I'll have a job after this. It was a very stressful, anxious time. Those are two moments in my life where I remember I was really anxious a lot. What, what about you? What makes you anxious? You know, what comes to your mind as the most anxious moments? Perhaps for some of you, you know, finding a life partner or meeting someone to date could create that anxiety. Or going in for exams or, you know, if you're immigration status. These are all things that can create anxiety. But Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that we are walking through, you know, if you are having a relationship with me, if you are my disciple, and if you have entered into that relationship and we have that relationship, you don't have to be anxious. Well, that's just so affirming to know that if I have an authentic relationship with Jesus, I need not be anxious. And in the passage that we just read today, three times he says, do not be anxious. He repeats that in verse 25 and 31 and 34. 
So when you say three times, that's quite emphatic. And so let's look briefly today at what causes anxiety and how we can overcome anxiety and how should we live a victorious life when we have overcome the anxiety. What causes anxiety? Now, first of all, Jesus says there are two things you don't have to be anxious about in life. He says, do not be anxious about your life. By that, he talks about what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. So Jesus is talking about, don't be anxious about your life. By life, he means what we need to sustain ourselves daily, you know, our internal biological needs about food and drink, and our body, by which he says, what we need to live, our external physical needs like clothing and things that we put on. And the reason he says this, very simple, life is more than food and the body more than clothing. You know, the logic he is using here, um, it's called a, a fortiori logic, which is like he's going from the bigger to the smaller. He gives two illustrations here. One is taken from human experience and another is taken from a subhuman experience. And in the human experience of how we see the world, it goes from the greater to the lesser. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. And the corollary for that means you are more important than the birds of the air. And then for clothing, he talks about the lilies of the field. He says, look at them, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And if God clothes the lilies, will he not take care of you? Seems like a very logical, very simple, very straightforward process. But then why do we get anxious? Why do we really get anxious? And if you dig deep and ask the question why, we feel anxious when something we feel is very important for us and we trust will make our life great and will help us to feel that if we have those things, I'm in control, if that is taken away, is when you're going to get anxious. And for life, it's food and water, very essential stuff. If we think if we have those physical things that are important to live a life, if our physical needs are dialed in and I know them, that I have them, it will give me a sense of control in how I live my life. But that's not the truth. In fact, those very things which we think if we have will control us eventually. We will not feel in control, but they control us. You know, the Bible talks about God being a personal God, a God who cares for his people. And way back in the Old Testament, we have the story of the Israelites who had to learn the simple truth the hard way. You know, God had done amazing things for them. He had rescued them from Egypt with mighty wonders, destroyed an entire army, split the Red Sea. Yet, when they did not have food and water, they thought they were going to die, and they started complaining because they got anxious. What's going to happen? You know, anxiety does something really significant for us. You can catch yourself if this is true. It makes us forget the past and doubt the future. It makes us forget the past and doubt the future. And second thing anxiety does is it makes us forget who is really in control. And when Jesus says, do not be anxious, he's not saying, don't think about food or water. He's not wanting us to not be thinking about it or planning for it, but he's talking about anxious thought. 
You know, that's the same word, merimnate, that is used to describe Martha when Jesus was there. And she got distracted. She thought, Jesus needs stuff. Sometimes that's our attitude in life. We think, oh, God is there. I know he's like there in some heaven somewhere and he's doing his thing. But I need to help him to help me. So I need to get these things so that God's work is easier, you know. And that makes us even more anxious. Because you never know that you will have them. And guess what? Even when you have them, you are really not in control of your life. You know, as we just heard um, a while ago, today was a very difficult day for me and several of the sports fans. You know, I was shocked. I couldn't believe that, you know, the, uh, the NBA legend that he was, Kobe Bryant, who used to go in his helicopter to work all the time. This was his routine. In just a matter of seconds, he passed away. And it's terrible. You know, a few weeks ago, he was interviewed by a pastor friend of mine in LA, and he had this post on Instagram admiring Kobe for what a wonderful guy he was. Not just on the court, even off the court. He was an amazing dad. He's been doing so many things for children. And if you look at his life, I mean, and, I mean he had it all, but that doesn't really help us, and that doesn't give us any surety of life, and which is why in verse 27 it says, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single R to a span of life? It's not like if you have enough food and water and clothing or jobs or uh, uh, financial stability that you're going to be able to prolong your life on earth. God is the one who decides that. God is the one who owns that. And don't let anxiety let you forget him. And by doing that, don't give power to things that actually don't have power. If you worry about this relationship working out, and unless it works out, you think your life is not going to be great, you have given power over to this external thing. If you think that you need to make these grades so you can be successful and land these top jobs and only then your life is complete, you have given power over to that idea, that pursuit, to get you. But trust me, God says, they don't have power. I am the one who has the power. And it's not just me, some random person. You know who I am. You know who you are trying to forget most of the time. You tend to forget that I am your God, the Father. That's the word he repeats. He says, our Father who provides for the birds, our Father who clothes the lilies. Don't you think your Father will do this? And if you have that filial relationship with God as a father, which is why he asks us to pray, our father, because that is what we most of the times tend to forget. And therefore, Jesus addresses, O oh, you of little faith. Why does he call us out on our faith? Isn't it enough if I believe Jesus and who he is and he is this perfect God and I'm, I'm imperfect, I'm sinful, and, and I need him as my savior? Isn't that enough? He says, no, you still have only little faith. Because you tend to use your faith only in some spheres of your life, but not in all of it. We trust God for our salvation, but not for our provision. And therefore, we think we have to take that on our own hands. You know, this week, um, my daughter Sophia, she celebrated her seventh birthday. You know, she was super excited that it was her seventh birthday, but also something amazing happened in this uh, birthday. And I might have shared this before that. Before this, every time 
I leave home with her, and if my wife does not come along, she would start throwing a tantrum and she will freak out. Because in her mind, she was thinking, we are leaving mommy away. And there was a separation anxiety. And it happened because she was sent to three different foster homes. And every time, she would leave people whom she had trusted and thought that's going to be her home. And therefore, she always carried that anxiety all these years in her life. And despite me trying to affirm to her, Daddy will never do that, Sophia. I will never leave you. I will never leave mom away. She will literally cry in the car. And then closer to her seventh birthday, there was a chat. we had a chat, and she said, I don't know, for some reason, she said, Daddy, I think after I'm seven, I'll probably not do it. And so she turned seven, and we got in the car to go somewhere, and Jamie was inside, and she said, do you want to try leaving mommy and going now? I'm not going to cry because I'm seven years old. <laughs> and she did it. And I was like astonished, but I realized whatever may have been the logic behind the number seven or seven years old, it's actually now clicked into her that I am her father and I will not let her go through that. See, we probably have different life experiences. Some of us have grown up in abundance. Some of us have grown up in not so much of uh, abundance. And we then tend to have these things that make us put faith on things on which we should not be putting faith and giving the power away to that. But the problem is we, it is easy for us to trust God for salvation, but so hard to trust him for his provision. And that's why he says, you of little faith. We think that our faith stops in our saving faith, but in our daily lives, we don't need that faith. But that's what Jesus says. No, when you are in my kingdom, when you are in a relationship with me, when I am your father, I'm going to take care of you, and so you can be free. You don't have to worry. Just live for the day. And he did deliver the daily manna, just what was enough. We saw that during the Lord's Prayer. So what should I do if I don't have to be anxious? Well, if you are anxious and you are going to make decisions based on those anxieties, it's a spiraling thing that goes down. He says, this is what you have to do in terms of a response to anxiety-free living, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He says, now your entire outlook on life will change if you're able to really trust me as your father. Your vision for your life will change if you trust me as your father. Your life's ambitions and career goals will change if you trust me as your father. Because now, since you know that I am in control of your business, all you have to do is be concerned about being part of my business, which is what my kingdom is all about. And that's why he asked us to pray, your kingdom come. It's not a very intellectual thing when we pray what we are actually praying is father i trust you and i want to submit myself and my entire life to align with what you are doing in this world how your kingdom is breaking into this world to bring peace and joy and love and drawing all men to yourself. I want my life to be aligned towards that. I want to use my gifts, my talents, my passions, my abilities, not towards hoarding more wealth for myself on which I'll place my security, but on seeing how I can let my life be expended so others may be drawn to you, so that I may be able to be a channel of blessing to this world that when people see who I am and what I do and the products that come out of the labor of my hands, they are something that will point people towards you, and that will become my life's ambition. I will then not always be looking at finding the next job that will be the safest job, that will be the best in the safe school district for my life and my kids. 
but it will be the place where I know it can be of help in unleashing God's kingdom. You know, Nicholas uh, von Zinzendorf, uh, he, he was a count of Zinzendorf in Austria, and um, he was one of the key persons in the Moravian missions movement. Uh, he lived between 1700 and 1760, and there was something very dramatic that happened when he visited um, Copenhagen in 1731, to attend the coronation of King Christian VI, he actually met a converted slave from the West Indies called Anthony Ulrich. Now here you have a picture of two people on two ends of the economic spectrum. Zinzendorf was nobility and, and Anthony Ulrich was a slave who had nothing. But Anthony Ulrich was someone who had been touched by the gospel and had given his life to Christ, and he was looking for someone to go back to his homeland to preach the gospel to the black slaves, including his own sister and brother. And so Zinzendorf, who was the count, um, he raced back to Hernhut, where they had formed a community, and they wanted to have a communal living that was radically different. And he went to find men, and... Immediately, two men volunteered, and they became what is historically known as the first Moravian missionaries, and the first Protestant missionaries of modern era, even predating William Carey, who was called the father of modern missions by 60 years. And within two decades, Zinzendorf sent missionaries around the globe to Greenland, Lapland, Georgia, Suriname, Africa's Guinea coast, South Africa, Amsterdam's Jewish Quarter, Algeria, Native North Americans, Ceylon, Romania, and Constantinople, and more than 70 missionaries from a small community of fewer than 600 people answered the call. And by the time he died in 1760, the Moravians had sent out at least 226 missionaries around the world. And if you read the Moravian missions movement, they had literally changed the world in being a blessing to them. And yet Zinzendorf, um, his famous quote was this, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. And, but guess what? History has not forgotten him because he cared not on the wealth he had, and so was Ulrich Anthony, who cared not on the wealth he didn't have. Both of them cared about helping his kingdom come. And so you and I are still speaking about them today. So if we leave these anxieties, if we let go of these things that control us, you and I can be involved in pursuit of an ambition that is bigger than us, in pursuit of a calling and a career that is so aligned with God's kingdom that will spill over into eternity. And God does not give us food and water and things for our life because we are righteous or because we are holy. In fact, we can't. And he knows that. And that's why Jesus came. And who, he not only preached the sermon he came in poverty. He left behind everything and came into this world for your sake and my sake. When he was thirsty on the cross, when he couldn't drink, when he needed water to drink. And when he was dead and he was resurrected and he's seated at the right hand of Christ, he gives his very own righteousness to you and me. And that's what God our Father provides, not just food, and clothing for this life, but the very righteousness of Christ who became nothing so you and me can have everything, and that's the gospel. What a glorious gospel it is. Friends, I want us to think about things that really makes us anxious, that keeps us awake at night, and maybe spend some time in prayer thinking how much power have we given over to them and 
think as to how much we have forgotten in the past how God our Father has beautifully blessed us, sustained us, and He has brought us so far. He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness is what His Word says. Will He not do all these things? And let's pray that these words will sink into our hearts and will affect our actions so we can live a free and abundant life pursuing things that will matter not for this life, but for eternity. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.